Welcome to worship with Hickory Grove United Methodist Church. I hope you feel God's blessings in your life at this very moment. Uh, as I stand here right now looking around this sanctuary, I see bright sunshine coming in through the windows, and it just makes me feel good. I hope that you will have an opportunity to get outside, perhaps take a walk in some safe place, uh, and enjoy God's nature. But you know what I'm really thinking as I sit here looking at the light streaming into the sanctuary through the stained glass windows? I am thinking that I really wish there were a lot of people here. I long for the day when we can open our uh, sanctuary and have you come in and worship with us. Let us all pray that soon this pandemic will be brought under control and we can worship together again. Join me in prayer. Oh, great God, almighty God, powerful God, loving God, we come before you knowing that to you all hearts are open, all desires known. There are no secrets hidden from you. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may more perfectly love you, that we may love you with an integrity uh, that is worthy of your mighty name. We pray all of this through the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Uh, at this time, we're going to have our opening hymn. I want to point out that it is a, a special hymn. It was originally written in Spanish. Uh, and uh, people who know Spanish better than I do, which I don't know Spanish, but this teeny bit, about three words, but people who really know Spanish tell me that this hymn is very beautiful in the original language and that even the English translation is good. I like the English translation of it. Today we have the great privilege of, of being led in the music by Deborah Huffschmidt. The first two verses, uh, she will sing the first two verses in Spanish. If you know Spanish, even a smattering of Spanish, I encourage you to sing along with her. And then when she repeats those first verses again in English, Everyone, please sing with Deborah.
Good morning and welcome to church. It's a beautiful morning to worship the Lord. We have some announcements to start with. Thank you to our Healthy Church Committee for plans that help keep our congregation safe. Due to the high rate of the virus in Guilford County, we're worshiping online only at this time. The Church Health and the Healthy Church and Committee will keep you notified of church schedules. As you know, we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also see the service after the service is recorded and uploaded to YouTube if you're a YouTuber like I am. Also, pray for all who work together to plan for this service. United Methodist men have decided to cancel the February Brunswick stew due to the high rate of COVID-19 County. Our missional network is making plans for Lent. Please pray for God to guide the development of a Lenten devotional and a series of worship services. Hickory Grove United Methodist Church is having a live streaming devotion at 8 p.m. each evening. We encourage you to participate. You can also see a recorded version of it on our Facebook page. Thank you for participating in worship. Please consider reading the scripture before Sunday's worship. The scripture for next Sunday will be Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Also pray for the musicians as they make plans for this service. As you prepare your hearts, consider asking a friend to worship with us on, through our live streaming service. Our church needs your financial support. Thank you for those who have been supporting our church. We continue to need your support. And it's easy to become a supporter. You can go to www.hickorygroveumc.org, click on the Give Online button. It'll direct you on how to do that. Or if you'd like, you can mail a check here to the church at Hickory Grove UMC, 5959 Hickory Grove Road, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27409. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Psalter today comes from Psalm 62. I'll be reading verses 5 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from God. Who alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance. 
and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in God at all times, old people. Pour out your heart before God, who is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the bounces they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this. Power belongs to God. And to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you repay all according to their work. And now it's time for Pastor Leon. Uh, going to have our children's time now so if you've got children in the home if you would encourage them to come over and look at the screen because I want to be talking to them for a few minutes uh, you may have noticed uh, kids and adults that the very first hymn was about uh, Jesus being at a seashore and you know what happens when you get close to the water either a lake or a sea a lot of people go fishing so today guess what I have I have my fishing rod. I've got a rod with line on it, and you can see there some bait and things like that. So I am ready to go fishing. How many people believe I can catch fish right here in church? Here I am standing at the pulpit, and I'm going to cast my rod. Let's see if I can throw it where there might be a fish for me to catch. Way over here, maybe there's a fish over there somewhere. Let's see what happens when I start reeling it in. Here I come. I've got something on there. What in the world is going on here? Pastor Leon, this means what Jesus meant by fishing for men. Fishing for men. That's exactly what <laughs> Jesus said, but I don't think this is the way he was talking about it. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, being a willing, uh, a willing uh, catch today. <clears throat> but children, did you see what I did? I threw a hook out and I caught someone. <clears throat> I made an effort to get, get in touch. I was pretending to catch fish. But really, when Jesus said, catch fish, he said, let me make you fishers of men. So Jesus changed the story just a little bit. He said, let me show you how to fish for men. Now, we really don't fish for men by throwing out a worm and a cork or something like that. Uh, instead, we fish for men with the way we live our lives. We fish for other people by telling them how to come and be with us in church. I also want to tell you something that you need to pay attention to. When I threw that cork and that line over there, there was not a hook in it. So don't do that at home. Don't get your, the fishing rod from your house and think you can throw it to your brother or sister and catch them. That's not what we're doing here. There was no real hook on there. But I did want to show you an idea or show you a concept or something you can learn from. And that is that by the way we live our lives, by the way we talk to our friends, we can draw them in to the church. We can make them be more like Jesus Christ. And that's the lesson behind uh, fishing for men today. Now I want you to pray with me. The way we normally do is I get you to put your hands together for prayer hands. Then I'll ask you to close your eyes and say the words that I say. I will say them first, then you say them. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for showing me how to live. Thank you for showing me how to live. Let me be a good Christian. Let me be a good Christian. And let me draw other children and other people close to you. Let me draw other children and other people close to you. Amen. Thank you, kids. We really appreciate you joining us. And someday before much longer, we will uh, be gathering together in church, and we will have a children's time again. But for right now, remember to say your prayers every night. Uh, at this time, we'll turn our attention to prayer for all of us. There are several prayer requests we have, and I want to encourage you to send in prayer requests. Uh, not now, because we've already got our list together, but uh, earlier in the service, you could send stuff before our service begins. You can also contact someone in our communication groups, or you can contact me. But we would love to have prayer requests. Hickory Grove is a praying church. 
We are a church that is interested in praying, and we spend time in prayer on our knees before God. Uh, many people, even this week I had someone talk about how much they like the fact that this church is a praying church. So we're going to join together and pray for some specific individuals and for others that we don't name. Join me in prayer. Holy God, uh, today we ask that you be with Brenda Newman, uh, the pastor of Muir's Chapel, uh, as she is uh, fighting with uh, COVID. We lift up Martha and Jean Merriman in this congregation. Uh, Jean continues to deal with uh, problems with his neck and throat. Take care of Jean and Martha as he holds him in her arms. We pray for Lauren, the daughter of Libby Lanier, who has had a trip and that she will be safe. Uh, Amanda Roberts has asked God that we pray for her niece's pastor. His name is Ken Harris, and he is, uh, uh, has been very sick with COVID and on a ventilator. We pray for this pastor. We lift up uh, Sharon Pearson uh, as uh, she continues to have uh, need for care, and particularly we pray for Garen as, Gary as he, prays, as he takes care of Sharon. I pray for Beth Carroll, uh, who continues to have problems with her ankle and some problems with her lower spine. Hold her in your hands during this very slow process of healing. Holy God, uh, our prayers are for <clears throat> people all around us, people who live even in different places. So today, God, we pray for Eric Benjamin's sister-in-law, Parveen, who is in a hospital in Pakistan with liver disease. Take care of her. Be with those who are providing her treatment. We lift up Mabel Shields, uh, Sharon uh, Weekly, as she deals with her cancer. I ask that you hold her and her husband, Carl, in your hands during this time. Uh, God, we pray for those who are restricted to their homes, uh, people who are not able to get out. Even, even when the weather is good, they are still unable to get out. Perhaps they cannot drive uh, anymore. They've lost their skills at, with age or disability. We pray for all of those who are restricted to home. God, uh, I lift up Gene Shanks, who is moving this weekend. Uh, we pray that you be with him. Let it be a good move for him. God, we know that there are others whose life situations are changing, who are moving from one place to another or from one circumstance to another. We pray for each one of those individuals. Uh, God, I ask that you uh, uh, be with uh, our plans as we uh, develop Linton, a Linton schedule, uh, both for this church and for our missional network. Let us find a way to worship you. Let us find a way to open our hearts to your presence during this upcoming season of Lent, which will begin in just a few weeks. Uh, there are several unspoken needs in this church. God, we pause for just a moment, and at this time I ask everyone to pray for their own personal needs and for the needs of a neighbor. God, we also praise you for the blessings you have given us. You've given us a, a strong and good church, and we thank you for that. Uh, you have led us in your path, and we thank you for your leadership in this church today. God, we thank you that Don Gwynn has uh, come through a, a, a period of medical problems and that he is doing better. Thank you that Melissa's mother is doing better as well. Uh, with all of these praises, God, we come before you thanking you for Jesus Christ who came and walked on this earth, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray. We join together as one community of faith, praying the prayer that Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now Randy Hardis will lead us in the anthem. I would ask that you pay attention to the lyrics, to the words in this, uh, in this anthem as it describes a lady who changes the direction of her life. And 
it flows from deep within. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Pray with me. Holy God, help me to preach your word and that only. Holy Spirit, touch the hearts of all who worship with us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. I appreciate uh, Randy singing that song uh, about the lady at the well who met Jesus, and she came one way and she left. She was a different person. Uh, she met Jesus at Jacob's Well. One of the clearest memories of, of my trip to the Holy Land when my wife and I and some others went to, to see the land where Jesus walked was going to Jacob's Well. Uh, you know, there are a lot of places in Israel where we know sort of what happened or we know sort of the location where something happened. We're absolutely sure, for example, that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. But we don't know exactly where. It could have been two miles downstream or two miles upstream. We sort of have an idea, but you can't really, really say exactly where. On the other hand, we know exactly where Jacob's well was. The well is in the same place. It has been identified throughout history. It is in the same place that it was thousands of years ago when Jacob watered his sheep there. It's the same place that it was when Jesus met this woman at the well. 
I have an interesting story, but I'm not going to take time to tell that story today. The point I want to make is that uh, this lady came as one type of person. She met Jesus and went away as a different person. This idea of changing the direction of our lives, of changing who we are, is the idea that I want to pay attention to uh, during this sermon today. As I start to read the scripture, I want to mention that there are two people named John. There's John the Baptist that is mentioned at the very beginning. And then there's another John who became John the disciple. They're two different people, and it might help you to know that. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, Jesus had been baptized at the, in the Jordan River by the first John that's mentioned. And then after that baptism, uh, he went into the wilderness for a time of prayer, a time of fasting, a time of resisting Satan to show his power over Satan. And it was after that that the story for today begins in Mark chapter 1. Uh, I'll be reading verses 14 through 20. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, John and James, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed them, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Uh, one of the first things I want to talk about uh, in these verses is the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus uh, said that the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Now, as we try to understand what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God, uh, I, want to re I want us to remember that at that time in Israel, there was a big conflict between the Roman military authority who was controlling the nation and the nation of Israel, which did not like that and was to some extent resisting. So there was a conflict between two groups, and it was to a great extent a political, con con uh, a little, a political uh, conflict that they were having. And to some extent what Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is greater than that political conflict. It is greater than the battle between the nation of Israel and the nation of Rome, that the kingdom of God is more than that. The kingdom of God is something that comes when we pray, Thy will be done, thy kingdom come. Well, what exactly is that? Uh, I tried to come up with an example this week as I thought about this and as I prayed about it. And I think the example I want to use is a, it is a made-up example, but I want you to imagine that some years ago when the king of England was in great power that, and the people all loved the king of England, this king decided that it would be a good thing for everyone to show their loyalty to him by on a certain day, a certain determined, predetermined day uh, in the summertime, uh, on a bright sunny day, on that particular day, everyone would get up at, at dawn, and as the sun came up, they would turn to the east, face to the rising sun, and salute their great kingdom of, of, of England. And he thought that would be a good thing to say. Everyone is loyal to me, the king, and to our nation. So at that particular day, everyone who was a uh, follower of the king of England, everyone who was a subject to the king of England because they loved him, did exactly that. Whether they were in their own little village, they stood up and, and uh, saluted the king at dawn. Or if they were not in their village, perhaps they were on a journey somewhere, out on a fishing boat, out in the ocean. They stood up and faced the rising sun and saluted their king. Maybe even they were on a uh, business trip into the uh, continent of Europe and they were in England or, I mean, in France or Germany or somewhere else. They saluted at that dawn, at that dawn their king. They showed their loyalty to him. See, it was not a location. It was not a geographic location that you had to be in England to be loyal to the king. It was the loyalty that matters. The, the subjects of France the subjects of Italy did not stand up and salute 
the king of England, only the ones who were loyal to him. And to some extent, that's the idea. That's not the full idea, but that gives you an idea of what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God can, is consistent of or is comprised of all of those who stand up and are loyal to our holy God and who try to bring about his kingdom, his rule, his, his power, his will in everything that we do. To some extent, the kingdom of God is not focused on a time or a place, but rather it is focused on loyalty. <clears throat> With that in mind, Jesus said, um, repent, he said that the kingdom of God is near. Then he said, repent of your sins and believe the good news. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now, the Greek word that Jesus uses there for repent is metanoia. And I've tried to have a little fun with that and play with it a little bit and sort of mix my southern uh, pronunciation of things with that word metanoia and, and, and give you some instructions. What Jesus said was, metanoia, y'all. Hey, y'all, whoever you are, wherever you are, metanoia. Um, he said, repent. But I don't, I don't think about repent in the way that we have over the years. Uh, we've got some good ideas about what repentance is like. But I think that the word that Jesus used, this metanoia, is broader than the definition that many of us have in our heads about the change, about repent. Uh, the, school, the church I went to when I was a kid had a good, clear thought about repentance. Basically, the church I went to, and I don't disagree with this, by the way. I want to tell you that I agree up to a point. I think that the real def definition of metanoia is broader than the one I was taught as a child. The one that I was taught as a child was, you're a terrible sinner. We want you to repent, go the opposite direction, and be saved. Uh, the, the term that is used sometimes is turn or burn. Turn or burn. Quit going that way, turn and go this way. If you don't, you're going to burn in hell. That's the way I was taught uh, repentance. And, and I kind of agree with that. But over the years, I have developed a broader, bigger, more comprehensive definition of the idea of metanoia, this idea of repentance that Jesus is calling us to. So I want us to, to, to that's why I'm using the word metanoia rather than repentance. Uh, and that's why I'm focusing on that. There's a story that many Methodist preachers have used in one form or another. In fact, I have preached used, using this example. Change it a little bit depending on the point I'm trying to make. But the example makes sense. I want you to imagine that you're walking along somewhere down a sidewalk. You've been busy. You've been somewhere. You've been walking a long way. Maybe you uh, missed your ride or something and you're tired and as you walk through this uh, suburban area down a sidewalk, there's one particular house that catches your attention. It's a beautiful house. It's the kind of house that you think, even before you get close to it, you think, hey, I like that house. I think I would like to live there. It looks like a homey kind of place just for me. And to your great surprise, as you get closer, there's a sign. And the sign says, come in. If you're walking by, don't walk past. Stop. Turn up the uh, driveway. Turn up the driveway turn up the walkway, come up the steps. We want you to come in the house. And for some reason, it catches your attention so much that you decide to take those few steps and you walk up on the porch. And there you see a table uh, with some water, a bottled water and ice and a little sign that says, we want you to drink some of our water. Feel free to take it. And then come in the house, come in. You drink a couple of swallows of the water. You're rested a moment there on the porch. And you look at the door and you said, well, maybe I will. Maybe I will step into that house. But you pause for a moment because you know that you're going from the outside to the inside. You are making a step. You're making a change in where you are and who you are and, and what's going on in your life. But you decide to do it. So you take that step into the house. And that step moves you from being on the outside to the inside. Now, I will say that that one step is very similar to the thing that I was taught as a child that repentance is. And that is a step from being in one place to a step being in another. And so I agree with the idea 
of repentance as it was taught to me as a child. And as many of us still think of the word repentance. It is that one step from being on the outside to the inside. But there's more to it. There's the first part where you were drawn up onto the porch, where you started thinking about it. And then the other part is after you get inside and you close the door and you're safely inside, you look around and say, oh, this is it. This is the place I can live for the rest of my life. I need to learn a little more about this house. I need to learn which chair is more comfortable for me. I need to learn how to turn the water on. Maybe the heat, the hot water is a little different than it was in places I've been before. But you adjust and you change. And over, over the years, you become more and more comfortable as an inhabitant of that house. The terms that we Methodists use are prevenient grace, the grace that draws us, that calls us to come up the steps and onto the porch. We use the term justifying grace, which is the same as the repentance of many other people, to step inside that justifying grace that makes us different, that puts us in a different place than we were before. But we also use the term sanctifying grace. It is the idea that we learn over the years and we change and become more and more who God wants us to be. Jesus says, follow me. Jesus asked, follow me. Do Come and live the way that I want you to. In these verses, Jesus says, repent of your sins. Come and follow me. Now, I have, that's part of the reason I'm using the word metanoia rather than repent. I'm saying metanoia, y'all, because I want you to understand this process of moving from where we were to being what we can be later on. But there's a little more to it. There's a little more that I want to talk about, about repentance, about this idea of following me. I want to say more than just what metanoia is. Metanoia is to change our mind, to go 180 degrees in the de other direction. There's a very distinct definition for that. But I want to talk a little bit about this metanoia, this change in direction. Jesus announced that all who hear should repent. They should metanoia. He, and he gives the example of these four fishermen, uh, two who were fishing, uh, Jane, uh, Simon and Andrew, and then James and John who were working on their nets. He says, I want to change direction. I want you to become something different. I want you to start fishing for people rather than fishing for fish. Now, I will point out uh, that, that the men who were fishing were doing nothing wrong. They were not terrible sinners because they were casting nets into the water. They were not terrible sinners because they were repairing their nets on the boat with their father and the hired men. They were doing things that were good. In fact, I encourage people to get a good, honest job, to make an honest living. That's what we're called to do, I believe, as Christians. But Jesus says, I want you to do more. I want you to be something different than that. I want you to... Uh, come and take another step. Perhaps God is calling you to change the way you have been living your life. Not that what you've been doing was wrong, but that God has something even better for you. Uh, I was surprised at the age of 50. I had been doing a job, working a career, and doing what I tried to do what was right. Not saying I was perfect in every way. I will not say that. But I will say that I was working in a career that I felt was good, that I was doing something productive, and then I was shocked absolutely shocked at age 50 to be called into ministry, to change direction, to become a pastor, to become a preacher in a church. And it was a big surprise to me. Do Be aware of the fact that God is calling you, and he may ca be calling you to live differently than you have lived in the past. He may be calling you to do something that you have not done in the past. Now, I will tell you that it is difficult to change. Some of us have tried to lose weight. We've tried to change our eating habits. It's a hard thing to do. I know that at one time some years ago, I weighed about 60 pounds more than I do now. And I worked really hard to get those pounds off. And I've gained a few of them back. So I'm still fighting that battle. It's difficult. Any change we make is difficult. It's not magic that we just suddenly become great followers of Jesus. That's the example that we were talking about by sanctifying grace, that once we're saved and once we're in God's hands, we live with him and we live in his home and we become different. Sometimes uh, it is helpful to have someone around us, someone to give us some suggestions and advice and to walk with us. Did you notice that Jesus called four at one time? He did not just call one person. And I think this example in this particular case is a meaningful one where he said, I want the four of you to come. I want you to be together. Maybe you can give each other advice. You can help each other out. Uh, 
I want us to metanoia. I want us to change, and I want us to use whatever, uh, whatever resources we have, our family, our friends, our prayers, to become different, different kind of people. If Jesus is calling you to become a full-time minister, today is the day to answer. If Jesus is calling you to become a lay speaker in the United Methodist Church, today is the day to answer. Whatever God is calling you to do, this is the time. Now, as Jesus called these four disciples, I want to point out um, uh, this one verse, verse 17. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. Fishing is an interesting thing. I like to fish. I fish a good bit. The rod that I used is one that I have caught a good many fish with. I haven't caught any fish since January, but I caught a lot of fish during the last year. I started to say I caught a lot of fish this year, but it was uh, during uh, 2020. Uh, with all the restrictions and stuff, I spent a little more time on the lake than I have at other times. But my wife and I caught a lot of fish this summer and spring. So let's think about fishing just a little bit. Uh, Mark Twain had sort of a funny story. Uh, he said that he, um, he liked to fish because it got him outside away from a bunch of people, but he didn't like to catch fish because once he caught the fish, he had to do something with it. He had to take it off the hook, take care of it, clean it, cook it. He didn't want to do all of that. But he found out that if he sat down on the side of a river just for the peace and quiet, people would come up and talk to him. However, if they thought he was fishing, they would leave him alone. They would say, Mark's over there fishing. Let's don't bother him right now. We'll wait till he gets through fishing to talk to him. So his solution was to put a cork and line on a rod with no hook and no bait. And he'd throw that out in the water and he would sit there for hours not catching fish, he didn't want to catch fish, but also he would sit there for hours and nobody would come up to him and talk to him, and he liked that. Well, when my wife and I fish, we try to catch fish. We have a hook, we have bait. In fact, we change the bait sometimes. We use one different kind of bait for one kind of fish. We fish different depth. Maybe if we want to catch crappy, we'll go deeper in the water. If we're trying to catch bass, we may throw up close to a, a, a bank somewhere, depending on the weather and the kind of lure we're using. We try to catch the biggest fish of that particular species that we can. We are fishing for the right kind of fish. That is dramatically different. And I want, this is important, so I want you to pay attention here. That is dramatically different from the kind of fishing that the disciples were doing. It is dramatically different from the kind of fishing that Jesus wants us to do. My wife and I fish for a particular species, a particular breed of fish, and we're trying to fish for a particular size, the biggest we can get. But when you throw a net, you throw a net and you catch all kinds of fish. You get every kind of fish that is out there. No fish is left out. And I think that's what Jesus wants us to do. Jesus wants us to throw a broad net. He wants us to catch every type of person. He wants us to draw in every kind of person we can find. He wants us to catch rich people. He wants us to catch poor people. He wants us to draw in people from a rural background who love being out in nature. And he wants us to draw in those kind of folks who look for a sidewalk because they never walked on grass. He wants us to... Um, catch people from one ethnic background and from a different ethnic background. He wants us to, to sometimes be, have people drawn in and we have to think, that accent's a little hard for me to follow. I have to listen especially closely. He wants us to draw in everyone. And surprise upon surprise, at this day and age, I need to tell you that he wants us to catch people from the other political party, whichever one that happens to be. It may be that one person catches, says, I want to catch a, that kind of party, but that's not my party. And the other one says, well, I'm going to try to draw in someone from the other party. That's not my kind of party. But Jesus wants us to draw in people. I believe that we are at a time in history when Christians are called to follow the example of Andrew, Simon, James, and John. We are to reach out to others and draw them in. And those disciples did. They responded exactly the way that Jesus said. He called them at once, and they followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. 
there's a couple of lessons in there that, that are really, in a way, are kind of hard, but I want us to listen to them. I want you to pay attention to this. Over the years, I have talked with adult children who were concerned about their parents. Is, what's going on with them right now? Are they maybe forgetting stuff a lot? Are they starting to have some medical problems? I, I'm doing the best I can to help take care of them, but maybe they need more care than I can provide. And, and there's this guilt that comes in a lot of families. The parents will say, I don't, I don't want somebody to come take care of me. I don't want to go live somewhere else. But you notice that James and John left their father in the boat with the hired men. God said, I will find a way to take care of them. I will have the hired men there. They didn't abandon their father, but they did follow Jesus. They made a difficult decision. Faithful living has consequences. Faithful living has consequences. The way we live our lives when we follow Jesus changes everything. I believe that God provided for James and John's father, that he took care, that God himself took care of them through the hired men, through others who were there. We are now in a time of societal conflict. We are now in a time of a deadly virus. I believe that God is calling Christians in a very special way to make a difference. He wants us to turn to metanoia, to change from the problems and conflicts we've had, and to go in a different direction. He wants us who are Christians to overcome the conflicts and the disagreements, to reach out to others, to throw out the net and draw them in and say, draw other people in and say, I love you. I know we've had conflicts in the past. We've disagreed in the past. But now is the time. Now is the time for us to come together, to love our neighbors. Jesus said, follow me. And we have to change. We have to repent. But I don't want to use the narrow de definition of repent. I want to use this much broader definition of repent. That is a lifetime of going from where we were to somewhere different. To becoming greater, better than we have been in the past. I want us to become more like Jesus. To do that, we have to really change. So I'm going to say it again. Metanoia, y'all. Metanoia. Everybody. Metanoia. Amen. Our closing hymn is led by Randy Hardis. It is Lord of the Dance. Another really great hymn, one of my favorites over the years. I encourage you to sing along and to think about how God is calling you uh, as we have this closing hymn. danced in the morning when the world was begun and i danced in the moon and the stars and the sun and i came down from heaven and i danced on the earth at bethlehem i had my birth dance then wherever you may be i am the lord of the dance said he and i'll lead you for the scribe and the Pharisee, but they would not dance and they would not follow me. I danced for the fishermen, for James and John, they came to me and the dance went on. Dance then wherever you may be, I am the Lord of the dance said he, and I'll lead you Sabbath when I cured the lame, the holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and 
nights on a Friday and this night turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your on your back. They buried my body. They thought I'd gone, but I am the dance and I still go on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance and he and the Father, help us to live our lives to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen.